All right, um, let's get started. So today we'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, model evaluation, in particular for classification. Just a reminder, there will be no class on Wednesday and also I won't be holding office hours on Wednesday. The TA office hours will be as usual. Um, I'm in Paris uh, on a scikit learn sprint, so I might also be slower responding to emails. Oh, also, so there was a delay in posting the homeworks. I'll be posting homework three uh, today, and you'll still have plenty of time to work on homework three. All right, so let's talk about uh, model evaluation. And I'll start with metrics for binary classification. So we already talked about classification in depth, and um, I want to review some of the metrics we have already seen and introduce some new ones. One of the most basic units of evaluation for uh, binary classification is the confusion matrix. In binary classification, usually we call one of the classes the positive class and one of the classes the negative class. And so we have a two by two confusion matrix uh, here as follows. So in this confusion matrix, the, um, so there's different, yeah, different people have different conventions on uh, whether this is a confusion matrix or a transpose, but uh, and Wikipedia changes that every now and then. But so let's say in, here in this convention, the rows are the classes that are predicted by the model, and the columns are sorry, the, the columns are the classes predicted by the model, and the rows are the two true classes. And so you can evaluate this on either the training or the test set, and you can look at um, which things that actually have the true label negative have been predicted negative, this is the top. Which ones that have the true label negative have been predicted positive, this is uh, over here. The false, uh, so this is true negatives, false positives. Things that are actually positive has been predicted negative are the false negatives. And the things that have been predicted positive and that are actually positive are the true positives. So one important thing here is that this positive negative is uh, just a convention and it's something you decide based on the problem. Very commonly, the positive thing is a class of interest. So if you predict whether a patient is sick or not, the positive class would be them being sick, even though that's not like a, a positively connotated thing. Very commonly, the positive class is the minority class. Uh, so if you have like very imbalanced classes, traditionally the, um, the smaller one is the positive one, which is the one you're interested in. But it's, uh, in general, it's something that's uh, up to you, the data analysis, to think about which class do I call the positive one. And we'll talk a, a, about a, a bunch of the metrics where it actually matters which class you call the positive one. And the semantics will change if you call the other class the positive class. And I'll come back to that. One of the most common measures that's derived from this uh, confusion matrix is accuracy. Accuracy is the sum of the diagonal divided by the sum of all the entries. So the diagonal and the confusion matrix are always the correct predictions. So it's the correct predictions, true positives plus true negatives, divided by the whole count of samples. So it's the fraction of positive samples and then accuracy. Accuracy doesn't depend on which class you call the positive class. So that's kind of nice. And we've already seen accuracy used in scikit-learn for classification. It's the uh, default when you call the score method. So here, I'm using um, the breast cancer data set that's built into scikit-learn. I do a train test split. I fit logistic regression, a linear classification model. I predict. And so I can, there's an accuracy function. I could use the accuracy function based on y pred and y test uh, to get the accuracy. Um, here I'm using the confusion matrix function on y test and y pred to get the confusion matrix. I can see here the uh, most of the entries are on the diagonal, basically meaning that um, the classifier is pretty good because it get, mostly gets things correct. 
You can also see that there's a class imbalance um, because there's more samples in the bottom row than in the top row. So there's like 90 in the bottom row and only 53 in the top row. So the uh, class that's in the second row is about twice as frequent. And if you call the score method, we can also compute the accuracy. So here, if you compute the sum of the diagonal divided by the overall sum, you'll get uh, 0 0.9. So this should be relatively familiar to you. But accuracy is very commonly not a very good score. It's very easy to understand and it's very commonly used because it's so easy to understand. It's like the fraction of correctly predicted samples. But if your data is not balanced, this becomes way less informative. So assume you have a data set where 90% of the data are positives. So you have a nine to one class imbalance. Um, sorry, it's a 10 to one class, a nine to one class imbalance, right? And so here, let's say I have three different predictions, y pred one, y pred two, y pred three. And I have y true, which is the true um, labels. And so for me, all three of these, if I compute the accuracy, they're all 90% accurate. What does it mean they're 90% accurate? Is this a good prediction or a bad prediction? What do you think? One person said good. One person said bad, good. That's all the answers there are possible. So um, in truth, so it's not really possible to say, and it depends on what your goal is. Um, you can see here, here is the three confusion matrices corresponding to the three predictions. So y pred one always predicts the positive class. It always predicts the majority part. It's a constant model that doesn't do anything. It doesn't need to look at the data, it just always predicts positive. Clearly that's a useless model. This model has 90% accuracy. So the model, so saying, oh, I have 90% accuracy, doesn't tell you whether something is good or not. This completely trivial model, in this case, has 98% accuracy. And if your data has even more imbalance, it's, let's say you do ad click prediction and no one ever clicks on ads, so it's like 99.99% is non-clicks. So it's very easy to get 99.99% 90, uh, correct by just saying people don't click on ads. It's a very useless model. So if someone tells you, oh, my accuracy is this high, if they don't tell you what the class imbalance is, it means nothing. So, but let's look at the other models here. So the second, or the predictions. The second prediction, y pred two here, um, has this confusion matrix. And you can see that um, it breaks the positive class pretty well. And actually it has no, um, no false positives, so no mistakes here. And it gets all the negatives correctly. So there's 10 negatives and identifies all of them correctly. This model is also 90% accurate. If we actually care about this class, this small class, and identifying these um, 10 samples that are sort of negative, labeled negative here, this is an amazing model, uh, if this is what we want. And then the final model sort of has a mixture. It does like a reasonably good job on both classes, um, but it has as many uh, false positives and false negatives as it has true negatives. So depending on what you want to do with your model, this model might be useful or might not be useful. The main point that I want to make here is that just looking at accuracy itself doesn't tell you whether the model is good. Even if you know this is, um, the data set is 90% one class, 10% the other class, you might say, okay, a constant model is 90% accurate, so if my model is 90% accurate, it's bad because it's as good as the constant model. And that's sort of a valid thing to, um, to think, but also there might be useful models that are useful and still only have 90% accuracy, and you can't distinguish between models that might be useful and models that are just constant by looking only at accuracy. We can look at the confusion matrix here, and the confusion matrix gives us much more information, and um, 
So it allows us to basically make a better judgment of is, will this model be useful for us or not. The problem with looking at the confusion matrix is that it's sort of um, not very aggregated, gives us a lot of detail, but say we want to do a grid search, you want to pick parameters, you want to pick a model, there's not a single number that we can compute. So there are several um, single number metrics derived from the confusion matrix that uh, are very commonly used, and I want to discuss next. These are particularly uh, precision and recall. So precision is also called the positive predicted value, PPV, uh, is the true positives divided by the true positives plus false positives. And um, so this is the, yes, it's the row normalization of the true positives basically in the, in the confusion matrix. So it's the uh, true positives divided by the sum of the first row. Recall, on the other hand, is also called sensitivity, coverage, and true positive rate is true positives divided by true positives plus false negatives. So these are both based on true positives, but they're normalized in different ways. The first one is um, normalized by everything that's predicted positive. The second one is normalized by everything that's actually positive. So what precision means, out of everything that I predicted as positive, how many of them are actually positive? If, prediction, uh, if precision is 100% and I predict something as being the positive class, then there's basically a 100% chance of it being the positive class. If precision is 50%, that means I have a 50% chance of it actually being the positive class. Recall, on the other hand, normalizes by uh, all the positives that are like actually positive. So here, a recall of one means that everything that is actually positive, I also predicted as positive. So I like the name coverage, which to me is like, um, more telling, so I covered all the true positives, and then maybe I got some more, but I at least covered all the ones that I'm interested in. And so these two are two um, slightly competing measures of um, how well you're predicting. So precision wants you to make few false positives, and recall wants you to make few false negatives, in a sense. And so you can look at either of these um, as a measure that's sort of hopefully more helpful than accuracy. But you can also, if you look at only one of the two, it's not super helpful because you can um, get recall very high by just always saying positive class. If you say everything is a positive class, recall is 100%. Um, then your precision will be very small. You can also just um, say only the ones where I'm very, very certain I call it, po uh, I predict as positive, then your precision will be very high because if something is predicted as positive, you're very certain about it, but your recall will be lower. So there's a trade-off between the two. If you want a single number to summarize, summarize both of these properties, you can look at um, the F score, for example, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. This is um, a little bit of a hack, maybe, because there's not really a reason why you should look at the harmonic mean in particular, but um, it kind of gives emphasis on the smaller of the two. And so if, if something has a good F score, it means it had a good precision and it had good recall. These are very commonly used. Um, so here the caveat applies that these depend on which class you call the positive class. So if I have the, a particular prediction problem and, I and someone tells you, oh, my recall is this, you need to know which class is the positive class. If you 
So because these are not symmetric, if you swap the roles of uh, positive and negative class, these metrics will change. And it's quite clear, like the T's, uh, sorry, the P's and the N's are not symmetric in these formulas, right? So if you switch P and N, you'll just get a different number. So if someone tells you my recall is this, um, often they implicitly tell you which class is positive, but it's much better if you say, this is the class I picked as positive. Um, small caveat in scikit-learn, if your classes are arbitrary strings, I think the lexically smallest will be Okay, actually, I, I shouldn't have said that because I don't, I'm not 100% sure. Well, it uses the lexical ordering, uh, and then I think the smallest class is positive. But, it might, but I'm not 100% sure. If the classes are uh, 0 and 1, or minus 1 and 1, then 1 will be the positive class, otherwise 0 will be the positive class. But you should check what's happening if you use these kind of metrics. There's um, many other metrics that are derived from the confusion matrix, and you can see this very nice overview on Wikipedia. Um, so here's the two by two confusion matrix, and then you can get these different row normalizations and column normalizations. And as you can see here, there's uh, precision here, and recall is here. And if you go to different disciplines, um, in like statistics or in medicine, you might get like all kind of these different things. Oh, you can find uh, accuracy here. And so there's um, lots of different ways, but sort of in the machine learning and predictive analytics community, uh, I think recall and precision are the most commonly used ones. All right, so now I want to apply them uh, to these three different predictions that I had before in the 90 to 10 imbalance case. So what I did here is I called the classification report function in scikit-learn. This will compute precision, recall, and f-score. And it will compute this for either of the classes being the positive class. So here each row corresponds to this class being the positive class. If my positive class is the class zero, um, which is the, how, the way I labeled it in, this, in these uh, charts here, then the precision of this is 90%. Uh, the recall is 100% because I uh, get all of them. And the f-score is the numeric mean. If one is my positive class, then the precision is zero because I got none of them. Actually, precision is ill-defined, I think. But it, um, if there's no prediction, you usually say it's zero. And recall is zero because I don't get any of them. And so these are like very different numbers depending on which class you call the positive class. You can then, uh, another way to aggregate these is to look at the average. And so here what it actually shows, oh, this is an old version of scikit-learn. This shows the weighted average where it weights the precision by um, the support. So support is how many samples there are. Here there's 90 samples in the positive, in class zero and 10 samples in the class one. Another way that you can compute that's more helpful is um, the macro average, which just averages these two numbers. If you just average these two numbers, you will get 0 0.45. If I can do divided by two in my head. Um, so here you see the weighted average. You can also look at the macro average. And um, if you look at the macro average over all classes, actually looking at the just precision or looking at just recall is informative because you take all the classes into consideration. If I just look at recall for one of the classes, clearly this is not entirely informative because this very trivial constant classifier has a recall of one. Okay, here, the, the second prediction has a very different picture. You get a recall of one for class one, but a precision of uh, 0.5 for class one, and a precision of one for class two, so on. And um, 
here there's a mixture of both, but it's like uh, mostly worse than this one actually. The precision is, uh, okay, the recall for class zero is higher here, but everything else is worse. All right, so now you have a whole bunch of numbers that help you to interpret um, how good this uh, model is. Question is, which ones should I really care about? And so we come back to something I discussed in the very beginning, which is goal setting. What is my application? What do I care about? And uh, what are the outcomes? One way to think about what, we, what you care about is to assign a, uh, costs to the confusion matrix. And these can be literal costs. If you're in a business, you can say, what does a false positive cost mean? What does a false negative cost mean? Like, in dollars. How much do I win if I get a true positive? Is that a new customer? Is that a product sold? What does each of these things mean? Or you can think about what does each of these mean for my brand in my marketing campaign? And um, if you can compute these costs based on the confusion matrix, then you can start optimizing this cost. Another common way to um, think about these metrics is what kind of guarantees do you want to get give? So usually your boss will ask you, how good is your classifier? And if you don't want to tell him anything, really you can tell him it's 99% accurate, and then they'll be happy, but you know you, it doesn't man mean anything. But if you want to give them something meaningful, usually you want to give them some guarantee. And a guarantee can be something like, 90% precision and 90% recall for this positive class. And hopefully your boss understands what that means. Otherwise you can explain this, is, this means if I says A, it's positive, there's a 90% chance uh, it's actually positive. And if something was actually positive, there's a 90% chance I got it. And that's something that's sort of reasonably interpretable and also meaningful. So really, bef before you look at these metrics, you should think really hard, what, what do we care about? And what um, do, do you want to think in terms of costs? Do you want to think in terms of guarantees? Um, do you think, want to think in terms of something else? Is there a particular trade-off between precision and recall that you care about? And so on. All right, so let's say you figured out that you what you care about, like you care about uh, recall for class one a lot, or recall for class zero. Uh, one very easy way to make your model um, align more with your goals is changing your decision threshold. This is something that's quite related to what we talked about last week and calibration. So by default, the binary classifier says uh, yes, if it's more than 50% certain. But you can change the threshold and say yes, only if it's more than, say, 85% certain. If you do that, then the recall for, for the, sorry, the precision for your positive class will increase because only when you're very certain, you'll say yes. And so if you care about the precision of the positive class, or if you care about the uh, recall for a negative class, then uh, you can increase this by changing the threshold to be more conservative. So here, I built my logistic regression model. I can just predict using the model that uses the 0.5 threshold, and I can do a classification report. Or if I want to, I can also look at the probability for the first class. And now instead of at 0.5, I threshold it at uh, 0.85. And you can see my precision went way up. So, I, or not way up, but it's better. And um, but my recall got lower for class one, but recall for class zero got higher. So now I only predict yes if I'm quite certain. And um, so there's different ways you can pick the threshold. If you know your classifier is calibrated. 
you can um, pick the threshold based on the actual probabilities. So if you know your uh, classifier gives you good probabilities, I can say, oh, only make a prediction if you're 85% um, certain. A different way to look at this is to look at the precision and recall values uh, that you get for a given threshold. So I can try out different thresholds and I can see what gives me the trade-off between precision and recall that I'm actually looking for. Question? <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing that uh, you should take care of here is that you shouldn't be doing setting a threshold on the test set, uh, but you should do this on a validation set because um, you can't really use your test set as any part of the model building and setting the threshold as part of the model building. Otherwise, let's say I pick the threshold here uh, to have a pre precision of one on uh, this test set. If I get new data, it's probably not gonna be one. Nothing is ever 100% precise. So this is too optimistic an estimate, uh, or it's very likely to be too optimistic an estimate, and if I pick the threshold using this test set, I should use another level of validation to actually figure out what are um, precision and recall at this, at this threshold. Sometimes, a priori, it's not entirely clear what are, what's the trade-off you're looking for or what is the guarantee you want to give. And um, a tool that's very commonly used to uh, look at different thresholds is what's called the precision recall curve. The precision recall curve basically looks at all possible decision uh, thresholds given a soft decision. So a soft decision is basically probability estimate or it can be an unnormalized probability. So here in this, in this class, I don't assume that probabilities are good, and I don't assume that I have probabilities. I can use a support vector machine, it'll give me like a distance to a hyperplane, which does, has no probabilistic interpretation, but I can still change the threshold to say which class is one and which class is uh, minus one. All right, so now here I fit my support vector machine, I created this data set which is um, just sort of two, two blobs and it's imbalanced. And I picked parameter really badly so it's gonna look weird. And so then I can compute a precision recall curve based on Y test, which is the true test labels and the decision function of the support vector machine. And this is the outcome. So what this is is Looking at all possible thresholds that are or all possible predicted values, what happens if I threshold a decision here? So, if I threshold a decision at the highest predicted value, usually I get a precision of one because only I only predicted one for the most certain one that was probably correct, and then I have if I pick the threshold there, I have a precision of one. If I pick my threshold as the um, least value that I'm observing. This means I always break the positive class, so I have a recall of one. And usually, you'll have a monotonous function going in between. So basically, it, as you increase your threshold, sorry, I guess, as you decrease your threshold, um, you get different trade-offs between precision and recall. And so the ideal classifier would be in the top right here. If you have a point in the top right, you get precision equal to one and recall equal to one, which means uh, you're perfect. And so the closer you are to the top right corner, the better. I um, circled uh, one particular point here, one particular threshold. This is the default threshold used by the um, support vector machine, so it's, it's zero. So if I call predict, what it will do is it will give me cl a classification according to this point, so by default I'll have a recall of like 0.82 or something and a precision of um, 0.74. 
But if I change the threshold, I could get many different uh, trade-offs. Um, so for example, I could get a recall of like 95% if I set a th threshold here, and I would only decrease my precision a little bit. So if I really care about recall, I might uh, change the threshold to be over here. Generally, there's uh, sort of it's good to be as close as possible to this corner. So if having no other information, you can basically you might want to pick the threshold that brings you closest as possible to this top right corner of one one. Just from comparison, here's a different model. Uh, random forest classifier. The random forest classifier gives you probabilities or something that claims are probabilities and the default threshold for that is 0.5. So I also plotted in here the, what the random forest gives you. So at the, at the default threshold, the um, support vector machine is better than the random forest because it basically they have the same precision but the support vector machine has uh, higher recall. But uh, in different areas, it might be different. So mostly the support vector machine is better, but let's say you really care about having a really high recall, and you want to have a recall that's very close to one, then maybe the random forest would be better than the support vector machine. And so um, maybe, maybe to point this out explicitly, I'm not changing the models here. I'm not changing the data or the model building process. I have exactly the same model. I just change how do I go from the predicted probabilities to making a decision. And by changing how I make this uh, decision from probability to yes, no outcome, I can get many different classifiers that all live on this curve. So each point on this curve corresponds to a different classifier I can get by applying a different threshold. So here, yeah? Yes. Okay, the question is, so this uses the probability by the model. Do we care about whether it's being calibrated or not? Um, not really, because you, here we don't really care about what the model sa says. We only care about what re um, recall and precision we get as a, as a function of a given threshold. So here we can do this even with completely unnormalized probabilities, like like a decision value, for, like a distance from the hyperplane in, in a sport vector machine. So what we care, we, we use the test set outcomes to compute precision and recall. And that's basically where sort of the, the true world comes in. And um, as th this is how we measure whether this is a good threshold or not. What is the precision and recall that we get out of it? And this doesn't say anything about whether the probabilities were good or not. We, here, we now basically abandoned thinking about the probabilities and we only uh, care about, let's say, precision and recall or some other measure of the decision. In, in the end, very often, or Possibly always when you apply supervised learning in the real world, you have to make a decision at some point. And there's different ways to say whether this decision is good. And th this is one metric where you can, how you can quantify what kind of decisions you're making. So here again, we kind of got a very, um, fine-grained view of what's happening. We're looking at all possible thresholds. So this is nice if you want to have a very detailed understanding of what's going on. But um, again, if you want to do model selection, this doesn't help you so much. Again, you can do something that is more of a summary that you can do for, say, grid search. One thing that's commonly used is average precision. Average precision is somewhat related to the area under the um, precision recall curve, but it's more like a lower step function approximation. So basically, for each possible threshold, you sum up the precision at the threshold 
times the change in recall. So this is like a, doing like a quarter, like a lower quadratic approximation of the integral or something like that. Um, and so here you sum over all possible thresholds. And so this gives you sort of an average over all the possible um, precisions and three calls you could have. This has the benefit that you don't need to pick a single operating point. It has the uh, downside that it's very hard to interpret. If you tell your boss, oh, my classifier has an average precision of uh, 0.7, they probably have no idea what you're talking about. Or at least if you tell it to your uh, customer, they will definitely have no idea what you're talking about. It's also never really what you want to optimize for. Like your business goal is never to have a good average precision. But it's like a good intermediate goal that you can look at before you really focus on one particular goal. So I would use this for doing grid searches before I figured out what is actually my business metric. In the end, I might do grid searches using the closest proxy for the business metric that I can get. Um, again, with everything, as with everything I said so far, these depend on, this depends on what's the positive class, so always keep that in mind. And um, also, this measure is now independent of the threshold. So this means that the threshold could be very bad. A classifier that always predicts positive using the default threshold. So if you have like an SVM and whatever you call predict, it always gives you one. This model could have a perfect average precision if it ranks all the points in the right order. Average precision is a ranking loss in the sense that it checks is the rank of all the points correct? Like, if is the probability or decision value smaller if I'm in class zero than if I'm in class one? But because it integra integrates over all possible thresholds, it doesn't care about the default threshold. So if you use this metric, the, your outcome that after calling predict might be like bad, even though this metric is very good. So if you use this metric, you need to take care of adjusting the threshold appropriately to what you want to do. <coughs> right here is like um, a small comparison. Just, um, I mean, just an example of how you can use uh, the average precision score. So here at the top, I want to compare two models, uh, the random forest and the support vector machine on like my two blob data set. And so here I can use F1 score. F1 score would take uh, Y test and the predictions on the test set. And in contrast to that, if I want to compute the average precision score, I would give it Y test. And for the random forest, the predicted probabilities of class one. So I call predict prob on X test, whoops, on class one, oh, sorry, and then slice it to get me, give me the probabilities of class one, or I just give it the decision function of the test set. And um, I'll show you some tools how to do this uh, a little bit more easily uh, later on. Wow, I should really speed up. All right. So another measure that's very commonly used is the ROC curve, which is quite similar. In the ROC curve, instead of uh, looking at precision and recall, we look at false positive rate and true positive rate, which are two other guys in our zoo of different metrics. Um, the true positive rate is actually exactly the same as the recall, it's just a different name. And the false positive rate is false positives divided by false positives plus true negatives. 
So ideally, you would want to have a false positive rate of zero and a true positive rate of one. The, you can, the curves here for the same models we looked at before look like this. Uh, they often look a little bit smoother. Now the optimum point is at the top left where the false positive rate is zero and the true positive rate is one. So this is historical conventions, but so the y-axis here is the recall, which is the x-axis in the precision recall curve. Uh, so they share one axis, but the other axis is, is, is different. And again, I plotted the default thresholds. So what I've found is that in particular for imbalanced data sets, the rock curve might not allow you to differentiate between classifiers as precisely. Um, so here, maybe you would think it's more of a wash between the SVC and the uh, random forest, whereas in the other uh, plot, it was pretty clear that unless you look for very high recall, the support vector machine was always better. Again, you can compute uh, something, uh, summary statistics. Um, here in this case, it's actually the area under the curve. So um, it's often called just AUC, area under the curve. In scikit-learn, it's called uh, rock AUC to say this is the area under the ROC curve, not any other curve. But in the literature, you often see just AUC. One of the things that I like about this measure is that it's always 0.5 for random predictions or for constant predictions. So you know what the baseline is. For basically all of the metrics, you don't know what the, um, what, how good the random prediction would be unless someone tells you what the uh, class imbalance is. So for accuracy, you need to know the class imbalance, and that is what's the accuracy of a random prediction or a constant prediction. Um, for average precision, um, you can compute it, but I can't compute it in my head. For rock AOC, it's always 0.5 for binary classification. If you want to dive a little bit deeper into this, there's actually a very nice paper that I like, the relationship between the precision recall and the RC curve that talks about these two curves. And the summary is, they measure similar things but are somewhat different. Um, but if, what you can say is if one classifier, sorry, if one precision recall curve always dominates another precision recall curve, the same will be true for the rock curves. But if they intersect, then sort of all bets are off. But yeah, in particular for imbalanced classes, it seems that the precision recall curve is sort of a better way to um, distinguish models. All right, so given that I spent half of the class already, I want to summarize um, the metrics for binary classification that we discussed so far. So there's um, the, the one that is used all the time that's default in cycle learns accuracy, and accuracy can be really bad, in particular in balanced class settings. So uh, beware of accuracy. If you want to use, uh, if you want to evaluate a single threshold, you can look at uh, precision and recall, ideally together, or the average over multiple classes of either precision or recall. Uh, you can also combine them using the F1 score, though the F1 score is a little bit ad hoc and uh, harder to interpret. If you want to look at multiple thresholds or uh, multiple possible classifier, you can use um, the um, precision recall curve and the uh, ROC curve. If you want a more detailed view, if you want to have a single metric, you can use average precision or rock AUC. There's another metric that I don't have on the slides that's a threshold based metric, so that's for a single threshold. That's um, uh, balanced accuracy. So 
which is sometimes used, but uh, the problem with balanced accuracy is there's two definitions that both have the same name and they comp compute very different things. And so I'm confused by this and I don't like to use it because it's, when someone says balanced accuracy, you never know what they mean. All right, questions about binary metrics? So the question is, how do you pick the thresholds and are there options to pick the thresholds? And so the only place where we actually changed the threshold and made decision based on it was, I was told slide 10, yes, here. So we are, there is a pull request for basically picking the threshold that puts you in the top right corner of your precision recall curve and there's different strategies to do that, but actually there's nothing in scikit-learn does that for you now. And so predict always uses 0.5 on probability and predict always uses zero on the decision function. And you can't change that. You can really very easily write code based on like thresholding the output. So you can do that in your code. Um, and we're working on making this easier with like inside the, the models themselves. So but no, there's, there's nothing that helps you with this right now. Um, the question is, is AUC always 0.5 even uh, for a random prediction, even for imbalanced classes? Yes, independent of the class imbalance, if you give it basically um, yeah, unrelated predictions, it will give you 0.5, which is the one reason why I like it. Of course, it's sort of interpretable. Um, so I said precision recall curve might be better than the RC curve and it depends a little bit in which part of the space you're more interested in. Um, but if you look at the definitions, it's um, if the positive class is the smaller class, then um, Okay, I'm not sure if I can, can give you the, the, a very good explanation right now, but um, basically you have these two negatives in here, which is uh, very, very big in, um, if you have imbalance, an imbalanced data set, and so the false positive rate like changes only very little, um, or ch change, it's harder for it to change than, um, precision is. And so if you have very imbalanced data sets, um, the precision recall curve might be more informative. Actually, I kind of want to make a plot to show this like pictorially, but I didn't get to do it, which is un unfortunate. But All right, let's move on because actually we don't have that much time left. So I want to talk about um, multi-class classification. Um, things become a little bit more complicated in multi-class classification. You can still do the confusion matrix. Um, again, the rows are, oh my God. Well, I, I always get confused because it, it sometimes changes. Now the rows are the true and the columns are the predicted uh, labels. And um, so you can see here, for example, that uh, this is the digits data set. So this is, zero to 900 digits. And uh, you can see that the class eight is kind of hard. And uh, sometimes class eight got confused with class two and with class three, uh, which kind of makes sense. I think this is class six, which also kind of makes sense. And so again, confusion matrix here allows you to give you a very fine grained view of what's happening. You can see which class is mistaken for which class. 
Um, you can also look at a classification report, which is a little bit more aggregate. Um, so you can look at um, precision and recall. Here again, this is for each class being the positive class. You can see precision and recall are one for class zero. So class zero was, was um, in a sense, very easy. There was no false positives and there was no false negatives for this class. Uh, other classes are harder, like class eight, that I already pointed out earlier. Uh, precision is 0.93 and uh, recall is 0.9. If you want an aggregate, actually a very um, nice aggregate is um, averaging these. So there's, in scikit-learn, there's four averaging strategies, mac macro, whited, micro, and samples. You shouldn't worry about micro and samples, which are for multi-label, which we're not talking about at all. Um, so there's macro and weighted that I was mentioned earlier. So macro basically just means for recall. I can do this for recall or for precision. Macro just means average them all and divide by the number, or sum them all up, divide by the number of labels. Weighted means I weight each of them by the number of samples in a particular class. So the weighted gives more emphasis to the large classes. The macro, in a sense, gives more emphasis to the small classes because sort of each class counts as much as the other classes. So if you care about small classes, the macro average um, is a pretty decent metric. And because it, uh, has, it contains all the classes doing either uh, act the macro average recall or just looking at macro average precision, e either of them is a good metric for multi-class classification. Um, and here there's not really, there's not this confusion about which one is the positive class because you sum over each class being the positive class. Oh, I should have said the caveat about accuracy obviously is the same as in the uh, binary case, if, you, uh, if one class is 90% of your data set, you can get 90% accuracy by always predicting that one class. So in the multi-class um, setting, accuracy is as bad in imbalance cases, um, and sort of precision and recall, particularly these uh, averages, can help. Uh, yeah, there's a typo. Please send a pull request to the slides. <laughs> um, so yes, here it should say uh, weighted average because micro average doesn't actually mean, make sense for, I mean, it's actually, it's, it computes the same, but well, it, it doesn't really make sense for multi-class. All right, we can also do something similar for our uh, ROC curves. So we can't really compute the curves in a multi-class setting, or it's not like there's some ways to do it, but there's not really um, one way that people agreed upon doing it. Basically, if you want to look at the curve, you have one threshold per class. So what would be a curve in like uh, number of classes, dimensional space, and that I, that I don't want to, like my monitor doesn't do that. Um, what you can look at the area under the curve. So there's two methods that are more or less commonly used. One uses the one versus one reduction, like summing up of um, binary AUCs, and the other one uses the one versus rest. So this is very similar to the reduction from um, multi-class to binary that we did for classifiers. Now we do it for measures. And basically, we know what an area under a curve is between two classes. And so now we can do it for all pairs of classes uh, J and K, and divide by number of classes uh, times number of classes minus one. Or we can do the same thing for, num for each class versus all the rest. And then divide it by number of classes. So here, um, 
This one is weighted by the size of the class. So this P of J is sort of the, the fraction of samples in this class. There's not really an intrinsic reason why the one versus one is weighted and the one versus rest, sorry, why the one versus one is unweighted and the one versus rest is weighted. It's just two people propose these relatively close in time in different papers. You could also do um, a weighted one versus one or unweighted one versus rest. So there are sort of four reasonable way to do, ways to do this and you can pick the one you like. I have not seen anyone do this for um, sorry, um, for average precision. Um, so if you find a paper on doing multi-class average precision, let me know. I mean, you can come up with all kinds of things, um, but I think it's important for these metrics to do something that is sort of established so that other people have an understanding of what you're doing. So just, there's like lots of papers coming up with lots of different metrics, and uh, each of them have their benefits and downsides, but if you use very obscure metrics, it will be very hard to communicate uh, why, you're, why you're choosing this metric and what the metric means. So that's why I would stick to things that are more established. Unless it's accuracy, don't do that. All right, so for um, the multi-class case, basically you have accuracy against, again, accuracy makes sense if classes are balanced, doesn't really make sense otherwise. You can have precision recall and F1 score and you can have the macro average of these, and, or you can have the weighted average of these, and each one of those as a single number is a good, good metric. Or you can use the one word as rest rock AUC or the one word as one rock AUC, and you can do it as weighted or unweighted. And uh, these guys are actually not in scikit-learn right now. They're probably in a development version by Friday. Um, lots of things will change in scikit-learn, uh, this week because uh, everybody's sitting together in Paris. Except me because I have to teach this. So, I, so I'm leaving after this lecture. Anyway, um, oh. so before I'm, I come to using uh, the metrics, I want to talk about metrics for regression models. Um, yeah. So most standard metrics, uh, oh, that's sad. Okay, most standard metrics are um, the R square, which is pretty easy to understand uh, because it scales uh, between zero and one. And um, the MSE, which is the mean squared error, which is nice because it, um, MSE relates very easily to the units in the input. So, R square has no units basically, and MSE has the same unit as the output. So depending on, does it make for, sense for you to think in like, how many dollars did I make, or how many kilometers mistake did I make, then maybe MSE is good. If you wanna know how far am I from being perfect, then maybe R square is um, easier to interpret. One of the things that um, some people criticize about the R square is that if you have outliers, in the labels, they might um, skew the R square a lot. Because um, the R square uses the variance, normalizes by the variance in the, or by the range in the labels. And if your range or your variance is very, very large because there's an outlier far, far away, then R square might be misleading. Um, so MSE doesn't really have that, that issue. Though MSE is, in a sense, also a um, little bit prone to being distorted by outliers, but it's more distorted by outliers in the test set, where um, any point can have an arbitrary big influence. So if you're far enough away, you'll have a giant influence. And so if you do a very bad mistake on a single data point, it might look like your model is bad, even though it's mostly good, but on some data points, it's really bad. Um, 
there's two metrics that you can use that are slightly less common that are uh, more robust to these kinds of outliers. One is the mean absolute error. So the mean absolute error, instead of using squared norms, you use um, uh, absolute values. So it doesn't escalate as much um, if you have bigger errors. The other way that you can do this is you can use the median absolute error. So then you uh, not only penalize the faraway points not as much, but also if there's only a couple of points that you're bad on, it doesn't matter as much because you're looking at the median error instead of the mean. Ignore the last bullet point, I'll come back to that. Um, there's another metric that you might run across if you um, work in industry because people in particular in forecasting really love MAPE. Uh, MAPE is, stands for mean absolute percentage error and um, it's the thing between zero and 100 because it has percentage in its name. And wait, it's really it's called that. It's that's such a confusing name because really it's a relative error, um, and it, because it divides for each prediction, it, it divides the absolute difference by the true value. What this means is, if the true value is uh, very large, then um, the relative error doesn't matter as much. So if I predict uh, here 38 instead of 50, I get a MAPE of 30. If I predict um, 20 instead of 5, I get a MAPE of uh, 36. Even though here the, the actual error is smaller than here, uh, because you normalize by y, the, um, uh, this, this accounts for more. So basically, you're putting more emphasis on getting these small predictions right. And it might make sense in some settings where basically you have more tolerance for error if the, if the magnitude is higher, but it's also really weird in particular, it doesn't make sense if your true value is zero because then you divide by zero. Um, and no matter what you predict, you have infinite error. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, this is something that's commonly used in industry. And uh, if you run across this, think very hard of whether this actually makes sense for your application. The answer is most likely no. Uh, and then try to convince the forecasting people you work with that this actually doesn't make any sense. You can use this slide if you want. Um, all right. Other things that you might want to uh, look at if you work on a regression task is are you over predicting or under predicting? Uh, similar to the false positives and false negatives, these can have different costs. And so you could think of can I write down um, a cost matrix here? So, how much does it cost me if I under predict? How much does it cost me if I over predict? Maybe these are not linear. And maybe there's like a function I can write down. How much? If the true value is x and the predicted value is y, uh, what? How much money do I lose if I make this prediction? And then I can optimize this. So you should really think about wh what what happens in my business case or in my whatever thing I'm working on um, if I predict this value instead of this value, and. The consequences are never mean squared error, and they're also never R squared. And so you can think about um, what this means and try to write down the metric of what actually matters for the case you're working in. There's also um, a couple of visual methods you can use. So one that's very commonly used is prediction plots, where you plot the predicted value versus the true value. This allows you to see if there's skew in the da uh, skews in the error, or if there's um, if you're under predicting or over predicting, for example. 
So here this is on the Boston housing data set and you can see that uh, for the high values in particular I'm under predicting. So I'm always predicting something that's like under 35 but for the things that are actually 50 I'm strongly under predicting. So actually here in this case maybe transforming the target using like a square root or something might make sense and it would make this model better. But you can clearly see there's like there's some skew here and uh, something weird is happening. Um, another plot that you often see is uh, if you rotate this by 45 degree then it's called residual plot and basically so in the in the prediction plot you want to have a diagonal line in the residual plot you want to have a horizontal line and again if it's something that is not a horizontal line like here then this means you have some skew in your data or some bias in your data so here you can very clearly see for small values this model tends to under predict for large values sorry the true is here for oh no, wait did i say it? i think i said it wrong no i said it right yeah, for, for small values, um, does it under, it under predicts and for high values also under, wait. Yeah, for, for small values, it, yeah, exactly. For small values, it over predicts. For large values, it under predicts. Um, bigger and small are very hard concepts. Um, and you can see this skew here very clearly. And so again, you can see th this model makes different mistakes. Um, and you can look at um, a histogram of the residuals also here. And I mean, you want this to be z uh, centered on zero and it's kind of centered on zero, but you can see there are some points far over here. And this means that uh, you severely underpredicted in some cases. And you might want to know there are some cases where it's severely underpredicted and maybe that's bad or maybe that's not bad, but you should think about it. Right. Oh yeah, so we, we had also um, sh these plots we saw a lot where we looked at a target versus a particular feature. We can also do this with the residuals. So if I have a model, I can predict a residual versus a particular feature. And I can see um, the, the idea here is that if there's structure left in this, then we didn't exploit the feature fully. Um, so for example, here, it looks like there might be still some information, or here there might still be some information in these residuals that were not learned by the model. So maybe I should like fix this and help to add the information that I can see is still left in the residuals at, to the model in some way. All right. Questions about regression? So basically, these should be okay. The errors should be normally distributed, and the errors should be normally distributed, uh, ideally independently of the true target. But here, you can see the mean changes away from zero. The the mean the mean residual is not zero for rooms of size eight. That me and um, that means the re um, if I basically um, decrease the is it decrease if I increase the prediction for houses of room of size eight I'll have a better model because the model always over predicts sorry always under predicts for rooms of size eight size eight. Um, question is how should you fix this? Um, yeah, I mean you can you can add new features basically, or you can use a different model. So here this is a linear model, and clearly didn't fit it well. So yes, adding polynomial features is a good idea. Uh, maybe we talked about the box Cox transform. Maybe that would help here. I mean, it's doing something similar in a sense. Um, 
yeah, transforming the target or transforming the features in some way uh, or using a different model. All right, so how do you use these now uh, for doing something like uh, cross-validation grid search? So this is true for both the um, classification and regression models. There's a parameter called scoring and scoring by de defaults to accuracy in classification into R squared regression. But you can actually set it to one of many strings, and then you don't have to worry about all these functions and community decision function, and whatever I talked about earlier, and just does everything by magic nicely for you. So here, um, if I do call cross file score on my, on my whatever synthetic data set, I get this. Um, if I set scoring equal to accuracy, I get exactly the same because that's the default for classification. But if I now want to use the rock AUC, I can just set it to rock AUC and I will compute the rock AUC. And it will, for the rock AUC, this is use the decision function and so it will automatically use the decision function for rock AUC. You can look in the documentation or you can look into the, there's a score, dict of all scorers. Uh, this is probably a little bit outdated. Yes, it is. Should update this, great. Um, and um, so you can, these are all the different strings that are allowed. One of the things is for scoring in scikit-learn, always, always means better. So the reason why I should update the slide is that actually mean absolute error doesn't exist anymore. Only negative mean absolute error exists. So you need, because by convention, Big is always good. We use the negatives of the MSE and so on as metrics. Um, of course, people ask, why is your mean squared error negative? Um, because it's actually in the negative of the mean squared error. All right. Um, so you can use any of these strings, and I'll use this for gross validation or grid search. You can actually also provide your own uh, callable. If you have your own... Um, your own metric, your business dependent metric, your weird science metric, whatever you want. You can define your own uh, callable. And the only thing you have to do is you have to give it this uh, signature. So it has to get the model that was fitted on the training set. So S here is the model that was already built that we want to evaluate. X is the test data and Y is the test labels or whatever data you want to evaluate on. And um, you need to have define a callable. So here in this case, it's a function uh, that takes these three things and returns a number. And the only condition is the hi, uh, high has to mean good. And this is a very generic interface and you can do all kinds of weird things with it if you want to. For example, if I want to penalize a model that has many support vectors in a support vector machine, I could use the accuracy, which is the score of the estimator, and then I can um, oh yeah, uh, check the uh, number of support vectors um, and basically, so this is the number of support vectors divided by something about, that's about the number of training points, and uh, then you have a trade-off between the two. Yeah, don't actually use this, this is just an example. that shows you, you can also do something like training time, for example, or how much memory does it take, or any property of the model that you want. Um, and so that's kind of cool. And then if you do this, you can um, use scoring equal to this uh, callable instead of one of the strings. So what you cannot do is scoring equal to accuracy score. So there's a function accuracy score in the metrics module, and we use this, and we use the rock AOC function and so on. You can't use these functions for scoring because they have a different signature. They, they have, don't have the signature. So you can't put the functions in here. Um, you can put in a string or a callable with a signature. 
All right. Questions? The question is, how do we deal with unbalanced data? And that's next Monday. All right, that's it for today. Thanks.